Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. It's very nice to see you all here. Uh, welcome on behalf of St. Anne's to this Centre for Personalised Medicine lecture. Welcome particularly to Professor Steve Sturdy, Professor of Sociology of, Me of Medical Knowledge at the University of Edinburgh. And um, his title, as you know, is A Genomic Revolution in Medicine, Historical Perspectives. Now, for those of you who don't know much about the Centre for Personalised Medicine, it's a joint venture between the Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics in the Medical Sciences Division and St Anne's. And Professor Peter Donnelly, the director of the Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics, and is a professor or fellow of St Anne's, and he has led this idea. And also here is Dr Ingrid Slade, who is our first director of the centre until she stepped down in September. And tonight's lecture is, in a sense, a new dimension for what we've been doing, because it's been established, the, the centre's been established, to bring together research scientists and, and clinical medics to consider the impact of the practice of, on the practice of medicine and the doctor-patient relationship of the age of genomics. We've also, though, considered this in a wider context, too. We've been bringing together health economists, regulatory lawyers and practical ethicists, those sort of interdisciplinary perspectives that bring academics together and also connect the worlds of the academic and practitioner and policy. And so it's excellent to have this evening a historical perspective from the history of science on the history of genomics. Now, Steve originally read Natural Sciences at Cambridge before deciding he was more interested in the social implications of science than in becoming a scientist himself. He went on to study philosophy of science, then sociology of scientific knowledge, gaining his PhD at the University of Edinburgh in 1987. And since then, he's researched and taught the history and sociology of science and medicine, first at Manchester University before returning to Edinburgh, where he's currently Professor of Sociology of Medical Knowledge and Wellcome Trust Senior Investigator in Medical Humanities. When you look at Steve's research interests, he describes them as the growth of scientific medicine from the late 19th century to the present, in particular using insights from the sociology of scientific knowledge to examine how developments in medical science have informed and then been informed by wider changes in medical practice and medical policy. And his current research is entitled Making Genomic Medicine. And here, as he says, his project aims to disentangle the scientific, technological, social and political processes that have led over the past 40 years or so to the current ferment of, ferment of activity around medical genomics and so-called genomic medicine. It's a perfect subject for us, and I'm delighted we've got him here. Steve. Well, thank you very much indeed, Tim, and uh, thank you all for coming along. It's uh, a pleasure and a privilege to be here and to be, uh, if, as Tim puts it, uh, a new departure or a new perspective, then uh, I hope that I'm... Uh, able to deliver a perspective that you find interesting and useful. It's, it's quite a, 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 a challenge as somebody who's working on the history of very recent science and medicine to come to speak at a centre where, in fact, quite a lot of the people, I think, in the audience are either engaged in or have been engaged in some of the kinds of, uh, of, of work and activities that, uh, that I've been... Uh, that I'm currently researching, at least one person in the audience has already been in interviewed by one of my research fellows. So this really is very sort of um, very close to the bone and close to the knuckle in a lot of ways for, for somebody who uh, I, 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 you know, is in a position of coming to tell you something about things that you're actually doing yourselves. But I'm also conscious that there are other people in the audience who may not be terribly familiar with genomic medicine and with uh, the science of genomics. So I'm sort of caught in this position of trying to pitch a talk which will speak both to those who know an awful lot about this subject, probably more about it as practitioners, certainly more than about it as practitioners than I do, and also people who don't know uh, necessarily a great deal about it at all. So what I'm going to try and do is take a bit of a step back and give a fairly general picture of one strand of the story that I'm trying to develop, of the way that genetics and then genomics, the sciences of genes and of the genome, became implicated and involved in medical research and medical practice over the past 40 years or so. And I'm going to try and step back and give you a reasonably sort of broad picture of one strand of that story, which I hope will be of interest to people, whether they uh, know the 
the details but may not have seen the bigger picture or if they know the, uh, a little bit about the, the broader history but may not know the details of the genomic story. And I want to home in at the start on a word that gets used an awful lot when we're talking about genomic medicine and that is revolution. Because ideas of, or the language of revolution, is really quite a commonplace in talking about recent developments in human genomics and genomic medicine. So, at the announcement of the publication of the first draft of the Human Genome Sequence on the 26th of June, 2000, President Bill Clinton stated that genome science will revolutionise the diagnosis, prevention and treatment of most if not all human diseases. Tony Blair was uh, beaming in by satellite link to that press conference and he echoed that sentiment. Let us be in no doubt about what we are witnessing today, a revolution in medical science whose implications far surpass even the discovery of antibiotics. This language of revolution recurs, especially in, uh, in often in, um, amongst people who've been involved in the development of uh, First of all, the, sequence, the hum, sequencing of the human genome and then the rolling out of the science and practice that's come after it. So Francis Collins in particular, director of the National hum, Human Genome Research Institute in the United States, at the time of the announcement of the, um, the sequencing of the, the human genome, has been a real booster for uh, the language of revolution. He spoke uh, at a, a major public lecture in 2006 on genomic medicine, a revolution in medical practice in the 21st century. And four years later, his book, The Language of Life, was subti subtitled DNA and the Revolution in Personalized Medicine. And this language of revolution, this idea of revolution, is constantly being uh, reiterated and echoed in the popular press, in the popular <coughs> media, the idea of a revolution in medicine underway as a consequence of the, se the sequencing of the human genome is pretty much ubiquitous. Not everybody concurs, though, with this understanding of genomics and genomic medicine as revolutionary. Just to give a couple of examples, Peter Aldous in The New Scientist in January 2010, uh, commenting actually on Francis Collins, is the title of Francis Collins' latest book, said, is it too soon to cheer the personal genome revolution? The uprising seems to be fizzling out. And more recently, Timothy Caulfield, a Canadian professor of health, health law and a very widely read uh, popular author on health matters, said, this is not a revolution in any reasonable sense of the word. This is science unfolding, as science usually does, slowly. So, who's right? Are we living in the middle of a genomic revolution in medicine? Or should we see the changes taking place around us as just normal science, progressing in its usual piecemeal way? I'll give you a personal answer, my view on this, at the end of the talk. But before I do so, I want to point you to a particular feature of the way that most commentators talking about revolution, the genomic revolution in medicine, whether they're pro the view that it's a revolution or whether they're critical of that view, the way that they tend to think about it, implicitly or explicitly, tends to take in, uh, into, uh, in, into its framing of the question a particular kind of historical narrative. And this is a narrative that begins with the sequencing of the human genome and then says that either what a particular thing has or has not occurred. I, the, certainly it's the case that uh, that sequencing of the genome has led to developments in diagnosis, prevention and treatment uh, as uh, Clinton uh, indicated uh, in 2000. The question is for these commentators whether or not those changes can reasonably be described as a revolution. So on this viewing of it, the, the, what's not at issue for these commentators is the narrative. What's at issue is simply whether or not what's being described by that narrative is revolutionary or not. And the story that I want to tell in this lecture will follow a somewhat different narrative. So I won't focus, as this kind of narrative does, just on the scientific 
and technical aspects of the development of genomics and its applications, though I will cover some of those. But I also want to point to some of the important social and institutional changes that have occurred at the same time, and that indeed I think helped to shape the science and the technology. And it's a story that begins sometime before the sequencing of the human genome, and it's a story that aims to set, for instance, the Human Genome Project itself in a somewhat broader context. So I want to try and give you a somewhat different perspective than the one that is indicated in this uh, succinct uh, narrative that I've put up here. And once I've told you this different story, I think we'll then be in a position to come back to the question of whether current developments in genomics are revolutionary or not. So let's quickly go back to the 1970s and look at what knowledge and practice to do with genes and genetics in medicine looked like at that time. Medical genetics in the 1970s was a very a relatively small and relatively localised medical specialism, which really took uh, into account and dealt with two sets of medical problems. On the one hand, there were rare single gene disorders, conditions such as phenylketonuria, Huntington's disease, uh, mus various muscular dystrophies. Uh, by the 1970s, about, I think around about 700 of these were actually known. So a lot of different conditions, but most of them rare or in many cases very rare indeed. And then, so those are hereditary conditions um, transmitted in a Mendelian fashion. You can follow the transmission of the disease through, uh, through families and of the associated gene. And then another batch of conditions that medical geneticists dealt with that weren't hereditary in that sense, but were more, uh, that were uh, primarily birth defects. So Down syndrome, which is a chromosomal disorder, in some cases uh, there are hereditary forms, but those are very rare. Most cases of Down syndrome are sporadic. And then other birth defects such as neural tube defects, which are, not, are simply developmental conditions uh, rather than uh, having any genetic component. What they have in common and what brought them under medical genetics was the fact that in most cases there was very little uh, in the way of treatment. Phenylketonuria was really quite a, a, a standout instance of a, a genetic disorder that could be treated uh, quite effectively, but most there were simply ways of um, alleviating the symptoms, symptomatic relief, uh, and very little that could be done to, to halt the progression of the disease. In those circumstances, the kind of treatment or care that was provided by medical geneticists was primarily to do with providing reproductive counselling. So for those with Mendelian conditions in particular, uh, counselling on whether or not they were at risk of having an affected child, and if they thought they might, might be carrying an affected child, what they should do about it. So prenatal counselling, or preconception counselling, and then uh, if conception had occurred, it was sometimes possible in certain cases, and particularly things like Down syndrome, to do uh, prenatal diagnosis, and then counselling often about whether or not to have an abortion. So that was the main, um, the core of, of what medical genetics was about. It was about dealing with these kinds of conditions and providing primarily reproductive counselling, often linked to post and prenatal screening. And the science that was, this was based on involved either Mendelian genetics, the ge transmission genetics, being able to see that a, a disease was being passed through families, or it was to do with cytogenetics, looking at cells under the microscope to see if, for instance, in the ca case of Down syndrome, there was an extra chromosome present. And strikingly, there was very little to do with DNA. The science of DNA, what we now tend to think of as the core of genetics, involved in medical genetics into the 1970s. But by the early 1980s, interest in DNA was developing elsewhere. It was developing in the basic, basic medical sciences, basic biological sciences, in fact, in the field of molecular biology. Scientists working especially with bacteria and viruses developed a set of techniques that uh, 
retrospectively now I really get called they often get the, the get called the molecular biology toolkit a set of techniques that enabled them to um, work on the DNA molecule and to do among other things cut it splice it and introduce um, genes from one organism into an, another organism uh, the beginnings of genetic engineering this toolkit was uh, quite widely disseminated. It was a, there was a, a sort of gift, uh, a set of gift, of gift relationships of uh, people swapping enzymes back and forth and uh, different uh, kinds of DNA preparations, plasmids and so on that could be passed around. And they were taken up, this toolkit was taken up in various places. One was in relation to the development of uh, new biotechnology companies. In the late 1970s and then the 1980s, see the growth of really quite a, a lively, uh, particularly at that time, a venture capital sector of new companies which are set up to use genetic engineering techniques to produce, in most cases, medicines, therapeutic uh, proteins that are already known and already in practice. Insulin, for instance, the hepatitis B vaccine. There's a lot of interest also in... Um, uh, in interferon, which is seen as a potential cancer treatment. Quite a, a, a proliferation of companies uh, using molecular biological techniques to produce these. Also, as well, we see alongside this, the, the um, gene splicing techniques uh, 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 one uh, area that we see new biotechnologies being used in relation to medicine. Another is actually in relation to uh, a, a group of uh, 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 molecular biology technologies called monoclonal antibodies, uh, which are, are very important as research reagents and then increasingly come on stream as diagnostics uh, through the 1980s. A real ferment of activity around setting up these companies with lots of university researchers working in molecular biology labs starting to set up their own companies and then starting to move into this sort of hybrid role as, on the one hand, researchers uh, in publicly funded institutions, on the other hand, running businesses. Really quite a, model, a, a, a common model now. It's very common for people uh, in uh, universities to also be uh, running companies around particular uh, molecular biology techniques that they've, uh, they've developed. But at that time, it was really quite new, and it was facilitated very actively by the American government in particular. Uh, among other things, they passed something called the Bayh-Dole Act in 1980, which made it... Uh, first of all possible but um, increasingly desirable for universities to seek funding not from public sources but by uh, spin-offs from their research, by commercialising their research. Uh, there were a number of changes to the IP environment, intellectual property environment, which made it very easy to uh, patent, for instance, uh, molecular biological techniques or genes indeed, uh, and we see a lot of genes being um, uh, being patented at this time. And then uh, changes to the structure of the banking sector, uh, the uh, investment capital sector, and the growth of venture capital. So there's a very deliberate push on the part of the American government to try to get universities and academics into these new kinds of hybrid roles. And it's promoted very, very actively. Less so in Europe, although there are similar uh, pressures, uh, particularly into the 1980s, for universities to make money by... Uh, spinning out com companies. But I think the important thing that I want to, to stress at this point is that this really is the moment when we see the emergence of this new hybrid public-private identity for academics in particular and the growth of companies that are very closely linked to university research activities and that blur that boundary between academia as a public enterprise and uh, industry as a private enterprise. So that's one place that biotechnology uh, or molecular biology impacts upon um, a medical industry producing medical uh, materials, medical substances, not impacting directly on what practitioners do or what they know, except by providing them with new forms of treatment, new medications. But one place where we do see these molecular biological techniques getting into medical research more directly is in relation to cancer. The 1970s saw a lot of research into 
the idea that uh, cancer might be caused by viruses. A lot of the uh, cancer research initiatives in the United States and in Europe were devoted to researching possible viral sources, causes of cancer. And I've already said vi viruses were a favoured uh, research subject for molecular biologists. And a lot of people working in cancer research became very in quickly interested in what molecular biology had to offer to research into potential cancer viruses. In fact, it turned out that there are um, very few can human cancers, at least, caused by viruses, directly at least. But using these molecular biological techniques, it became apparent that many of the kinds of cancers that occur in humans were a consequence, or were linked to, at least related to, mutations in human genes that were very similar to those in certain viruses. And the idea of oncogenes, cancer-causing genes, or genes related to cancer, became very current at this time. And a lot of the kind of research that was done in the cancer field through the 1980s was using molecular biological techniques to try and investigate the structure and the nature of genes and particularly mutations that were seen to be linked to cancer. A lot of this was academic research, but some of it also was undertaken in the new startup biotech companies. And some of this at least led to quite successful developments in new therapeutics. And probably the, the sort of poster child for this approach to cancer uh, came with the discovery of a gene that was seen to be linked to uh, certain kinds of breast cancer. In, I think it was 1986, the gene was identified, the HER2 gene. And certain kinds of cancer were seen to be uh, linked to um, overproduction of a particular molecule associated with that gene, the HER2 molecule, the re uh, receptor. And one of the biotech startup companies in the late 1980s, Genentech, designed a monoclonal antibody, a uh, molecular uh, biological treatment for uh, that targeted this protein, the HER2 receptor protein. Uh, it was licensed as trastuzumab in 1998. The, um, the uh, uh, commercial name, the brand name for that is Herceptin, a hugely successful uh, pharmaceutical innovation. At the same time, other, some of the larger companies also were starting to get interested in the early 1990s in uh, what molecular biology had to offer to cancer treatment. Uh, and in particular, Ciba Geigy started looking at a class of proteins, of enzymes, uh, which they were able to target genetically or identify genetically to identify targets for, drubbing, for drugging. Um, and in particular, uh, they developed a, a, a molecule not, a, not a, um, an antibody, but a, a small molecule called imatinib, which was licensed in 2001 as Gleevec. So we do see um, some very successful industrial developments coming out of this molecular biological understanding of cancer. One other way that this cancer research also does get into medicine is through the emergence in the 1980s of a new viral condition, only very indirectly related to cancer, HIV. But HIV is a retrovirus. Many of the people who've been working on cancer viruses were working on retroviruses, this particular family of cancers. Some moved very quickly into HIV research. And in that case, we're able to uh, quite quickly uh, characterize and then sequence <coughs> the genome for HIV. Uh, and on the basis of that, identify proteins that then could be used as druggable targets for pharmaceutical interventions, and a number of successful pharmaceutical interventions came out of this. So this is an area where we see a lot of academic research, a lot of publicly funded research, charitably funded research, but also a lot of industry interest and some successful developments, both by biotech startups and by uh, larger pharmaceutical companies. The other place where we see molecular biology getting into medical knowledge quite directly is in the work that was underway to try and map and identify and locate genes associated particularly with rare disorders. 
Mendelian disorders. There'd been work going on since the 1950s to try and map where on the chromosomes uh, genes associated with rare disorders might be located. The model for this was um, linkage mapping as performed in uh, well-known um, so genetic research organisms, particularly Drosophila. You can map how close two genes might be together by observing as you follow their transmission from one generation to, a to the next, how frequently the traits for which those genes code are inherited together and how frequently they may segregate. So the more frequently, uh, for instance, uh, you know, genes for eye colour in Drosophila and, and wing distortions are tend to be inherited together the closer they are on the chromosome. And chromosome maps were drawn up of Drosophila from the 1920s onwards. Attempts were made to map similar, uh, to use similar techniques to follow uh, human genes, and particularly disease genes, through human generations. The problem is, humans are a very young species, and they don't have as much variation, particularly the kind of Mendelian variation, the kinds of things that can be observed phenotypically in the adult organism. Uh, so it's much more difficult with so few um, visible markers to trace through generations to actually map genes. And molecular biology provided a, separate, a new set of techniques for doing this. Rather than looking at phenotypic traits, traits that can be observed in adult organisms, molecular biology provided techniques for identifying particular markers on the chromosomes, on the DNA itself. Purely molecular markers that probably in, in many cases had no, uh, no consequences for the way that organisms, the, the humans, developed, but that could be mapped by molecular biological techniques and seen how they were transmitted from one generation to another. So things like uh, restriction fragment length polymorphisms, RFLPs. Polymorphisms are basically places, genetic points, uh, or uh, points on the genome where uh, the, the genome can take one or another form, where there can be one or another form of, um, uh, of DNA in particular. And molecular biological techniques, mapping of RFLPs or mapping of an, another set of uh, polymorphisms, microsatellites, made it possible to say, is this one or is that uh, version of the polymorphism being transmitted through uh, a sequence of, of uh, a pedigree uh, of, uh, of, of humans, or are they... Uh, it provided a means of mapping uh, the genes, let's put it that way. So, using these maps, it became possible for the first time to start mapping um, disease genes. And a number of disease genes were located and mapped to particular places on the genome in the 1980s. So Huntington's disease in 1983, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, retinoblastoma, a rare cancer in 1986, cystic fibrosis in 1989. These, it's important to say, were not found by sequencing, they were found by mapping, which is a very different technique. But it was possible using this, these techniques to identify markers that then were very closely associated with the occurrence of the genes that were in turn associated with these conditions. And with these, it then became possible to conduct tests, not just for whether somebody had the disease or would develop the disease, but also if they were, for instance, carriers. And a number of tests started to be, to be produced for, for instance, uh, muscular dystrophy, uh, cystic fibrosis. Um, in many cases, these were simply produced by laboratories working in clinics linked to genetic clinics, but in some cases they were uh, commercially developed. And Genentech uh, started offering uh, to doctors and then direct to consumers a test for cystic fibrosis, including cystic fibrosis carrier status in 1989. So again, there's a combination of uh, academic work, work within health services and commercial work going on and a lot of overlap between these. Finally, the first full linkage map of the human genome was produced by a private company, 
Collaborative Research Inc., based in the United States in 1987. So a very, this was a very fundamental development. It was a key development that made it possible for other genes to be mapped. It gave you a point of reference for mapping other genes. And this came out of a commercial company. So we see quite a, a lot of successes getting underway, momentum building up in the 1980s around both commercial and academic interest in the use of new molecular biological techniques to understand human genetics and the genetics of human disease and to try and develop treatments or diagnostics for those. And by the early 1990s, we start to see really this sort of momentum building as we get a lot more buy-in, in particular by Big pharmaceutical companies. Big Pharma starts now to become much more interested in an area of research that, and development that it had left for up until then largely to the biotech startups, leaving it for the biotech startups to carry the risk. But as proof of principle is, is established, so Big Pharma starts to invest much more heavily in um, research and development. At the same time, we also start to see a new wave of biotech startup companies, small companies run mostly again by academics, founded by academics, which now start to focus not just on producing products such as insulin, but actually on producing information that can be sold to bigger drug companies to feed into their own drug development processes. So. These build in particular on the availability now not of gene mapping but of increasingly um, gene sequencing technologies. Sequencing through much of the 1980s was a very slow and painstaking process that required a great deal of human labour, labour took a lot of time. So insofar as some of the genes that I've described were actually sequenced at that time, it took a lot of doing, it took a lot of effort, and it was usually very highly focused work. Once you'd located your gene, if it was seen to be worth trying to sequence it, then you would. But increasingly that labour came to be more and more mechanised and automated. And by the late 1980s, some of the first automatic gene sequences are starting to become available. And these companies, companies such as Human Genome Science, Millennium Pharmaceuticals, Insight Pharmaceuticals, start to capitalise on this by using the new genome sequencing uh, equipment as a way of generating sequence data that then can be sold on uh, with, or at least with the expectation that it can be sold on to uh, other companies for their drug development uh, pathways. And this development of sequencing, and particularly the promise that seemed to be attached to it, is picked up as well by public funders. And it's in 1990 that we see the launch with very substantial funding, first of all from uh, the United States uh, National Hum Human Genome Research Institute and the Department of Energy, and then from the UK's Wellcome Trust of the Human Genome Project. And that is the project that will run through the decade. Exploiting the new sequencing technology, but also very much oriented, and I think quite explicitly so, quite deliberately so, to facilitating the development of that industry. It's seen as a way of promoting the sequence, the, the production of better sequences, and the production of sequence information is quite explicitly seen as a way in which the United States, Britain, and other European countries can promote and support the discovery efforts of the pharmaceutical industry. So for at least some of the key figures promoting the Human Genome Project, through the 1990s, this was an infrastructure project. It was a way of, of 
promoting the development of sequencing technology, of promoting the kinds of databases, informatic and bio, uh, bioinformatic technology that was needed to deal with and process that, in, that information, with the aim of helping the pharmaceutical industry, the American and British pharmaceutical industry, to meet what was seen as a growing challenge from uh, India and South Asia. So, there's a public interest in promoting private enterprise and private business here. But, and when I've been talking about the way in which public and private organisations are becoming increasingly intermeshed around these biotechnological concerns, that really starts to become problematic, or problems start to arise in the early 1990s around a number of issues. One of those is intellectual property and patenting. The IP environment, as I've said, was very favourable to patenting genes as a way of promoting this kind of research from the late 1970s. But a number of events happen in the 1990s which start to raise questions about this. In 1991, a scientist called Craig Venter, who will go on to become quite a a controversial figure in the Human Genome Project, was working at the National Institutes of Health, the United States um, public, health, uh, public, public Medical Research uh, Organization. And he developed a technique for identifying sequences of DNA that were known to be active, to be, sit, to be expressed, in cells that were metabolically active, that were only relatively short, so it wasn't a description of the whole gene, and the, the purpose of which, the, the purpose of the, the, the role or the activity or the function of that gene was not known. But it was a DNA tag, an expressed sequence tag, which uniquely identified a gene. Venter developed a means of mass producing these and he proposed, in agreement with the uh, NIH uh, Intellectual Property Office, that they should patent 6,000 of these. So these are sequence tags, they mark a gene, they effectively um, put your stamp on that gene, you say, I know there's a gene here, I don't know what it is, I don't know what it does, it is a gene, and we're going to patent it. And that proposal met with w a widespread condemnation from scientists and well beyond. The views that were expressed were, were very mixed. There was a, a views that you, know, you shouldn't be sequencing human genome data anyway, although an awful lot already had. Shouldn't be patenting it, although a lot already had. And uh, views that, um, on the part of uh, scientists, researchers, that this would tend to lock up intellectual property and in inhibit research. That, that view in particular about inhibiting research um, was further uh, came to the fore in 1997 when a company called Myriad Genetics, which had patented uh, in 94 a gene associated with breast cancer, BRCA1, then uh, also patented a second gene in 97, BRCA2, and started offering its own BRCA testing service and very aggressively preventing other organisations from doing BRCA testing, including clinical researchers, who then started to say that, well, because we can't do tests to determine uh, the uh, genetic status, the genotype of our patients on whom we're doing research, uh, our, our research activities into breast cancer are being seriously inhibited. And that marked really a turning point when we start to see questions about how far patenting should go and whether patenting is necessarily in the public interest. And this question of the public interest in particular comes to the fore. And we then see, following on from this, uh, changes in the way that patent courts start to decide on patent claims for uh, genomic data, genomic information. Uh, and in 2005, a federal court ruled that Express sequence tags, the things that Craig Venter had uh, proposed to, uh, to, to patent, aren't patentable because uh, 
it's simply not known what they do. There's no evidence of function or utility. And then in 2010, rolling on to 2013, a series of, uh, of court judgments on the myriad patents, the BRCA patents, ruled that actually those patents were invalid because DNA sequences are products of nature. So we see the rolling back of what can be claimed as intellectual property in the field of genetics. And especially we see this on the grounds that claiming of too much intellectual property in these kinds of areas, claiming particularly of intellectual property of the sequences of genes, is not in the public interest because it inhibits research. It prevents researchers getting on with doing the kind of work that will lead to new knowledge and to new products. And increasingly, this is a view that companies as well have tended to get around. Another place that we see this creation of, the, of if you like, a public sphere, or at least a, a sphere of commons of um, DNA information, came... Uh, when in 1992, sorry, let me skip over that, in 1997, um, a couple of deals were announced between biotech startups on the one hand and large uh, pharmaceutical companies on the other, which were intended, the large companies would put money into the startups to identify in particular gene variations, variants, Single nu nucleotide polymorphisms now, uh, which are for uh, those interested in developing drugs and in identifying the genetic basis of disease are of considerable interest. So two deals which are listed here uh, between companies, large pharmaceutical companies and small biotech startup companies, to assemble, to identify large numbers of SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and then collect those into proprietary databases which can be sold, access to which can be sold to companies wanting to do their own drug research. And again, this corralling of what is seen to be uh, vitally important genomic information, vitally important for continuing research, was seen as contradictory to the public good. And in 1999, a consortium was set up, the SNP Consortium, to create a database where publicly produced data could be hosted. Importantly, this was funded both by the National Human Genome Research Institute in the United States, a public funder, the Wellcome Trust in the United Kingdom, a charitable funder, and 10 other pharmaceutical companies, big pharma companies, who now had accepted this view that, the pro that excessive private ownership of genomic data was against the public interest, or at least against the interest of these pharmaceutical companies. So we see the development of this, cre again, the creation of this idea of a, a genomic commons, that there are certain kinds of genomic information that need to be kept accessible to those who can who want to work with it, and that corralling it into, uh, in the form of private intellectual property is against their interest, the common interest, in the development of science in this area. The final area of development that I quickly want to point to, the final strand of development in the story of genomic medicine, or the development of genomics in relation to medicine, comes with the Next shift in the search for disease genes. I've talked about how mapping disease genes was based around uh, particularly the, the, the Mendelian disorders and the idea that you can map them through uh, following their transmission through generations. That works for rare disease gene, for single di Mendelian disorders, genes linked to um, the, the uh, linked to single gene disorders. If you're interested in the genetic or genomic influences on common disorders, complex disorders, heart disease, diabetes, um, a, a range of uh, autoimmune and, and inflammatory conditions, because there are many genes involved and because those genes uh, may only confer a small increase in risk, a relatively small increase in risk, you can't map them by Mendelian means. An alternative was proposed 
uh, first proposed in the 1980s, that then became possible in the early 2000s, which was to look not at families and tracing genes through families, but to look at populations and to try and identify an, any associations that might occur between particular genotypes and particular diseases. A well-established epidemiological approach, but never before applied systematically to uh, the genetic causes of disease. And this became possible because, above all, of the availability of large numbers of single nucleotide polymorphisms, very high detail maps of, uh, the, of, of SNPs across the human genome. Importantly, though, this kind of approach requires populations and it requires large populations, both of patients, the affected individuals, and of controls, non-affected individuals who need to be recruited into the research so they can be genotyped and can, be, uh, can provide non-affected controls to ident identify associations. And a couple of different approaches were adopted to achieve this. First of all, the creation of biobanks. And probably the most notorious biobank, uh, but quite an informative one, an interesting one to look at, was uh, projected in 1998 when a deal was struck between a biotech startup, a company called Decode Genetics, with an Icelandic founder, although it was established in uh, the United States, and the Icelandic government to create a biobank which would um, have access to, commercial access, the company would have access to the health records of the public health services, the national health services in Iceland, which go back uh, to the 1910s. They would have access to that data. They would have access to um, tissues uh, held in the National Health Service in Iceland. They would have access to genealogical data uh, and they would be able to recruit new, uh, new members to the, the study as well. And I think there's the, the sort of thinking behind this and the importance of the population in particular is captured in this quote here that came out in the, uh, an announcement by Decode Genetics in 98. The scarce resource in human genetics as an industrial endeavour is a population that can yield the genetics of common diseases. The biobanks to be established under this agreement would provide Decode with instant access to an ideal population. Decode Genetics can decide to work on a disease without concern over whether it can find and secure an appropriate patient population. In the end, that plan foundered. Although quite a lot of Icelandic, uh, a lot of the Icelandic population bought into the idea that they could be uh, the site for the discovery of new genes and new drugs, uh, there was quite concerted opposition also to the commercial nature of this project and to the fact above all, that consent wasn't asked for, that these consent would be presumed, there would be an opt-out. If you were already dead, your health records were not, you, you couldn't opt out. Um, so there was a, a lot of concern about the privacy implications. And in the end, um, nothing really came of this. Decode sort of limped on uh, becoming a, a direct consumer genetic organisation uh, some years later. But there has been a proliferation of rather more, in most cases, rather more carefully thought out biobanks, including the UK Biobank, which is, uh, I mean, took a, a much more cautious approach to ethics. Uh, it took five years to uh, get the ethics structure right before even uh, starting to, uh, to recruit uh, participants into the UK Biobank. Other companies, other biobanks, though, and the Genome T Austria Tissue Biobank is uh, established using um, uh, clinical tissues that are, uh, uh, have simply been uh, incorporated, uh, tissues that happen to have been collected in the course of, um, of, of clinical work, routine clinical work, and started to be incorporated into uh, this biobank without, actually, in that case, uh, explicit consent being sought. And then there are proprietary biobanks. I mean, it's routine now if a pharmaceutical company organises a clinical trial, they will make it a condition of participation in that clinical trial that uh, patients uh, provide DNA samples which can then be used for genotyping. <coughs> 
So that's one way in which populations and the data about large groups of people is getting into uh, both public and private uh, biobank resources, databases, and so on. And then another set of studies um, which uh, uh, follow a case control methodology. So this is one, the biobanks bio are prospective. You, you recruit healthy people and see which ones develop a disease and which ones don't, and then you can compare them. Case control studies recruit unhealthy people, people with a particular disease that you're interested in, and compare them with unaffected controls. Um, and here again we see the growth of uh, the recruitment of very large numbers of people. A, a, a case in the UK, uh, one of the uh, probably most influential uh, case control studies, uh, which succeeded in finding in its first three years some 90 genes located, uh, linked to, uh, to common disorders, the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, which started in 2005. I mean, it recruited 14,000 cases, people with particular diseases, uh, 2,000 from a, a range of seven diseases, but then needed 6,000 controls who were recruited from the blood donor service and from a pre-existing uh, birth cohort study uh, which followed children through their lives, established in 1958. So we see here as well large numbers of people being recruited into uh, genomic research. Sick people, a lot of sick people, but also healthy people. And many of them recruited, I mean, the, uh, the UK Biobank, for instance, recruit, recruits through general practitioners' offices. So even the healthy people are recruited through the uh, health service. And that data then becomes, uh, with certain controls being placed on it, it becomes part of the data that is available for public research and, in many cases, private research as well. Um, research by private companies, but becomes part of uh, this genomic commons, if you like, alongside all the sequence data, all the SNP data, then you start to get the accumulation of personal health data getting in there as well. So that's the story that I wanted to sort of try and sketch out. And having done so, I want to return to this question of whether we're living in a genomic revolution in medicine. And let me start by just recalling how that question is usually framed. The conventional narrative focuses on the claim that new knowledge and technologies arising from the sequencing of the human genome could revolutionize the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of most, if not all, human diseases. So what light does the story I've told throw on this narrative. It's certainly the case that new molecular biotechnologies, including genome sequencing, have been hugely productive of new insights into human health and illness. And the resulting diagnostic and therapeutic innovations, however, cannot be attributed simply to the sequencing of the human genome. In fact, most of those that I've talked about so far had their origins well before the sequencing of the human genome. They're the products of a much longer history that began with the emergence of the biotechnology industry in the 1980s and that takes in multiple strands of research and development, including not just the growth of genomics, but also of what now goes under the label of proteomics, metabolomics, a proliferation of other omics. Omics are the thing of the moment. In fact, there's uh, some scientific wags have suggested we need a science of omics omics. So seen in this light, the development of new molecular methods of diagnosis and treatment is better understood as incremental and evolutionary, not revolutionary. At the same time, however, the story I've told in this lecture enables us to think about these developments in a rather different way from the conventional narrative. The story I've told isn't just about the growth of new scientific knowledge and techniques, but about new social and institutional configurations that have driven and sustained such technical innovations, and that include the Human Genome Project itself. As we've, as we've seen, these new configurations include a major realignment of public and private resources and a blurring of the distinctions between public and commercial interests. Increasingly, as well, health services are being drawn into this new public-private research nexus, 
and with patients and their clinical records being recast as an invaluable research resource. And this entails a shift in the role and the purpose of health services. They're no longer just a means of delivering health benefits to patient and patients and populations. Increasingly, they're also seen as a vital part of a new public-private enterprise of biomedical research and development in which the pursuit of public health is becoming more and more entangled with the pursuit of pharmaceutical innovation. And this, I would suggest, really is a revolution in the sense that it involves a fundamental reorientation in the organisation and purpose of health services. All of this undoubtedly delivers innovative med medicines, and some of these have delivered a very considerable health benefit as well as benefits to shareholders. Some of the cancer drugs, for instance, really are quite impressive. Some of the new anti-inflammatories are very effective. But the danger is that this overshadows and sidelines other aspects of the work of health services and of medical, the, the, the larger medical system, if you like the, um, the, the medical industrial complex, we might as well call it, I mean, the, the, the interweaving of um, health, health services, medical uh, healthcare delivery organisations and research and development and pharma particularly pharmaceutical organisations. My worry is that this configuration, that this massive interest, this massive concentration of resources, both human and financial and political, overshadows other areas of medical care and other forms of healthcare delivery that simply don't attract the same kind of financial and economic and political interest. And that in consequence, health services may become overwhelmingly oriented around the development and delivery of these new sciences and the new drugs with which they're associated, while other forms of care are devalued and neglected. It's important, I think, to ensure that this doesn't happen. How we do achieve this is a social and a political question, and it's a question that really requires a whole other set of conversations about the values that we see being invested in our healthcare services. And I worry that the currently dominant framing of a genomic revolution in medicine diverts attention away from these questions by telling a simplistic story of how medicine, uh, of how modern science and technology will transform our lives and will revolutionise medicine on its own, left to its own devices, without being considered in broader perspective. So I hope that what I've, well, what I've tried to do in this lecture is to tell a different kind of story, to try and give a broader perspective on where genomic, med genomic medicine fits in uh, the history of medicine and the kinds of political and economic interests that have informed the growth of genomic medicine and just try and point up some of the consequences for the direction of science and the aims of healthcare. And if my uh, story, the story I've told has opened up at least some space for discussion about these kinds of issues, uh, then I've done my job, but I'd very much look forward to um, hearing your questions and your comments, I believe, over a glass of wine uh, in the next half hour or so. So thank you very much indeed for listening.